I am Renee from Ilsley Public Library, Adult Services Librarian, and I am thrilled to be partnering again with Becky at Vermont Bookshop. Apparently, we had this relationship with the library before I was here, and Becky reached out to get us again. I'm pleased to see you. Uh, folks from home, I want you to know that those of you who didn't want to come because of poor weather, raise your hand. From California. Hello. This snow does not scare this family off. So I'm going to pass over to Becky. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks to the band Also, who traveled quite a distance to get here? Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Renee, and I'm really grateful to have the Ilsley Public Library as a partner in this um, renewed effort to have a local author event series. Um, so, I'm Becky Dayton, and I own the Vermont Bookshop here in Middlebury, um, and it is my delight to introduce, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, to introduce um, Joanna Bernini Congdon, or Jo, or Joanna, she's a woman of many identities. Um, jo is an author and an artist, primarily self-taught, um, inspired by a mother who studied art, history, and a father who was a storyteller. Jo is the mother, um, Jo lives in Charlotte and is the mother of adult children and is a grandmother and she writes, when not painting or writing or writing, family fills the corners of my life. I loved that line. Um, this kind of lyricism along with colorful characters in dreamy places fills the pages of her book, Never a Cloud, which we are here to celebrate this evening. And congratulations, Jo, on publishing your Thank book you. and I'm looking forward Thank to seeing that piece. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so this is, that's the lights. Do you want more lights? Yeah. Off. Oh. oh. Like this one, this one. See what I can do. Okay, so can only can do it outside. outside. That's nicer, that's so much better. Thank you, that's perfect for me. Okay, so I put together, um, thank you everyone, and I put together a slideshow um, to kind of give a genesis of the, all that went into, really, it's pieces of my life that went into the book, and uh, so let's see. So this is the Renaissance Mannerist, Herman Gino. And on this I say, the painter and the model, the writer and the character. This is, um, well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to tell you the piece, but for this I say, women are, men do. And then uh, I like this thought that the subject of the portrait largely remains a mystery. <clears throat> just as an overall for art. Fate, argument, um, sorry. Fate, something happens, nobody knows why. Uh, this is, well, some of the photographs in this collection are from the wonderful, he's a Welsh photographer who did the color photo. And it was a gift to me, and these also. Um, okay, I'm gonna go. Couples, portals in time, something happens and nobody knows why. What's quietly sidelined in life? That's, that's my beloved mom. Um, Zen asks, what did you look like before your grandmother was born? My mother, the art historian, late in life, always said that that was me, a uh, young girl reading by Fregenard. And uh, my sister, I picked this one for my sister, by Mary Cassatt. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's, they're very close. Um, the two sisters, siblings, all of this fills in the book. Houses filled with children, storytellers, and siblings. That's actually Jane Austen's home. Um, there, there she is. And I have here, my narrator's name is Violet, and Violet does not write with violet-colored ink, and neither did Jane Austen. 
places we haven't seen but know intuitively. The awkward entanglement of feelings emblematic of adolescence. Be true to yourself, allow for reinvention. A wee thatched cottage. Life is merely froth and bubble. Two things stand alone. Kindness in another's trouble. Courage in one's own. That's my Scots grandmother. And yes, the bagpipes played every Thanksgiving inside the house. <laughs> um, sorry, here. Oh, okay. Mothers and daughters. Generations. There is only one plot. Things are not as they seem. The pipes will bring you home. Let's see. Ah, yeah, I got a little off there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, paintings and politics. Now, yeah, click it too fast. The gilded frames. Protest against the rise. Tide, rising tide of conformity. The Renaissance, the 30s, the 60s, and 70s. That's some of my artwork from teen years. Don't, um, the boys and the patriarchy. There's a quote. We are who we were as a child until someone or something tells us we are not. This is really hard to follow. <laughs> uh, there we go. That's my painting. That's Juno. Um, take ownership of the free space in your life. <coughs> to, uh, make your own epoch. And this is a, a, a little quote. It depicted a vermilion Vesuvius erupting beneath a Mars black sky, one of many canvas, canvases from Will's own fiery-hued volcano period. That's from my book. A fertile period of time. Salvador Dali. In life like art, there has to be essential, an essential sense of weirdness. The book travels to Venice. It is, as, it is as easy to fall short of the truth as it is to overshoot it. This is, a, I'll say, Ravi Burns night. Uh, this is an actual, actual program from the 19, I think it's 33, yeah. Uh, Ravi Burns night in Massachusetts where my um, great-grandfather was the chief. Um... To have a relationship with the reader, with the viewer. This is a dedication and a book from my Scots grandmother to her husband. It says, to the hunter for good luck from the hunter's widow. The canoe is a piece of family history. And now it's immortalized in the book. Um, whoops, I'm sorry. There's a tip. I think I just went backwards a little bit. Abandoned places. Uh, I wrote about traditional subject matter, the still life, the nude, portraiture, the landscape. Artemis. Best friends. Entrances. How did you... Mm, sorry, houses you've seen in the back of your mind. This is one that inspired the book. Um, stable yards. When you buy a boat, check the hull. When you buy a house, locate the view. When you enter a relationship, connection, connection, connection. I ask, what happens when you think about the absence of silence? Generations, grandparents, it's a multi-generational novel. 
islands and oceans, the origin of life. Sail Bonnie Boat like a bird on the wing. Women radicalized in libraries. Vanity Fair's Becky Sharp, Pride and Prejudice's Elizabeth Bennett. Open meadows. Embrace the mess. <laughs> it arrived from outer space. And uh, yeah, that <laughs> he is much worse than that. <laughs> and uh, please join those gathered at Otterburn. And there's my illustration of the house that you saw previously that I fell in love with and felt I knew, you know, in the back of my mind. And uh, that's the slideshow. So I'm going to read um, the opening introduction from Narrator Violet. Chapter 1, Strange and Wonderful. Check your mic. Hello? Is it okay? I think it's off. Blue Violet, one boyfriend called me. I explained the sci science behind ultraviolet light. The cowboy from Cheyenne, Wyoming, rode in and christened me violent love. But I kicked him out, his saddle and his horse walkie too. Besides, he insisted on smoking in bed. The barbarian from Barbados, who dubbed me Drooping Violet, did so knowing I was in excellent health. The environmental lawyer from Hoboken who sailed the Sun Odyssey 49, used the cloying nickname Common Violet, Violet only once. The beat poet who cleansed, it, cleansed his unwanted energy by singing when he asked for a glass of violet water, I encouraged because I liked his voice. I tell you this because it is nearly impossible to fully know anyone, something along the lines of watching cloud formations and attempting to describe them, let alone recount their liveliness or artificial in motion. Even clouds have character. A careful observer can only know the sky if they have taken the time to live beneath it. As your storyteller, I acknowledge my limitations. My parents should have known that a name like Violet would cause some trouble. My father, Thomas Gray, was a phys physicist. I do wish he'd left Violet suspended at the inner edge of the arc. Instead, I spent a lifetime insisting indigo belonged to the color order of the rainbow, and as proof repeating Sir Isaac Newton's and mnemonic device, Richard of York gave battle in vain. For my part, I named my daughter Ava. Don't tell me about your successes, not just yet, but do guard your story well. This is a novel about a motley crew who grew into a family and how I became the matriarch. We are not different in our private concerns and wishes. I always carry a notepad, jot the date down, and write a sentence or two that accumulate into a number of illegible longhand pages. I am a writer. I had a path that I crisscrossed over Maine's rocky shore with a dog that I named Galaxy. Archibald Reed was off the road and over the bluff, hiking down to the Atlantic Ocean before he heard my goodbye. Actually, he missed it altogether because I said nothing, and I was just beginning to like his smell. He fathered my child, and even wilder and stranger than to dream of Shambhala, he never knew it. In the beginning, I collected fragments, but years have flown, and much has happened since I attended my first New Year's celebration at Otterburn in Wyndham, a sleepy dot of a village on the backside of Perthshire, Scotland. It was then that Archie's daughter, Margot Reed, handed me the letters. Perhaps I should state clearly why the events that unfolded matter, being of no historical of, or political import, if, is, if one is to judge pinpoints in time by the ushering in of a new pope or the dismissal of a president with tiny hands. I am writing a map for you, complemented by other stories I heard afterward, if my memory serves me 
a constellation, if you will, of soul and matter and truths therein revealed when a bankrupt way of talking to someone is denied. Dear friend, I wasn't headed somewhere to do something or archive a dream or achieve a specific goal per se, but to be there. Margot is Ava's half-sister, one she's never met. I tried to shield her from this convoluted at times, admittedly challenging family. On sober reflection, my psychoanalyst suggested once that I was riddling my obsessions by recording the transparencies I'd witnessed through other stories and that this action was a desire to heal and there could be some truth in this. Let us say it is an act of love. I do not promise you an accomplished design. Sometimes you have to believe things that are in contradiction among themselves. So that's where we start. And I thought I'd read a little section, one more section only, and uh, that happens between Margot and her grandmother at the house, Otterburn. The approach to Otterburn past two south-facing paddocks before the drive forked at the clipped hedge, which led into the stable yard. Otterburn sat in a wind shadow that faced south over the cars of tilt, with one corner of the 37-acre property tipped into a green crag of the Greeley estuary. Alistair had spoken of an artesian spring, but neither George nor Margot remembered where it was hidden. Legend said that a golden apple tree marked the spot. Crowded in the wood, it had grown so tall to catch the sun that the apples hung from the tip of the crown like clusters of grapes pointing south. Owen might know. Gooseberries and a great many dogs, her fingers stained purple, lips bright red, as she puckered at the twang of a sour berry she'd plucked too early. Margot, you can't pine after every stray dawdling at the door. Edwina's voice had been low and throaty. Her white hair braided around her head, her arm made rhythmic turns, stirring porridge with a wooden spoon. Lumbering in movement and slower still in speech, she'd seen the practicalities of living. Can I feed him then, Nana? He has one gray eye and one brown. Summer brings a new beast that you name and I inherit. Lay what's left in your bowl under the kids' gate rose arbor and crack an egg over it. The moon is none the worse for the dogs barking at her. Then go and give me a hand carting my pruning basket. The buttercups are creeping beneath the magnolia and need pulling. Then there are the gooseberries to pick. Which one is it, Nana? The rambler rose at the garden shed arbor, the one I'm always hollering about getting in all over. There's no stopping its white blooms as big as your wee face. How many dogs had she parked at Nana's? Just like Nana to fill her head with Gaelic proverbs about do dogs under the yellow moon. She exited the car, tipped the cabbie generously, and closed the door softly. A red cardinal landed on the drive before she entered beneath the columns of an open vestibule, turning the knob on the weathered black door. Two twists to the right, then a shoulder shove. Not hearing activity on the ground floor, she climbed the marble stairs, aided underfoot by a threadbare wool runner, her hand sliding along the balustrade railing. Set in a niche, stood a three-quarter size female figure on a plinth holding fruit and an urn. Margot smiled softly to see her. Edwina called her north and said she could deliver a storm. Would you give us a plot summary of your book. Tell us a little bit about the story and where it... <clears throat> Maybe read the back. Sure. Or tell us in your own words. Ah, well, the book is a, a, it's a very full cast of characters. I think there's 11 major players. And so we start with um, three women who don't come to a new understanding of home and family and um, we, it travels between New York City and of course Scotland and a little bit of Paris and Venice and the thrust of it is it, it doesn't cover
have a very big list. It starts in about October, and it ends in in the spring. And the every the whole group comes together. She's got these diverse stories, and they all come together. And uh, at a New Year's party that happen, happens over a week at the house in Otterburn. And that's kind of it. Do you identify with one of the characters in particular? Um, I guess I'd say that Violet is my alter ego. And all of them, really. <laughs> Yeah. I'm curious, <clears throat> when I visited your website, you seem to be uh, abundantly creative and uh, obviously interested in so many things. I'm just curious, why a book, why this topic, why this story, what, what spoke to you to make you pursue this project? Well, um, I always knew I wanted to write. And I had originally started with a memoir and uh, put that aside and said, no, I, I, want, I want to tell a novel first. Cause I, and the minute I switched uh, genre, I, I found great freedom and really enjoyed the novel. It's a huge sigh. And my, my imagination and my creativity just, just uh, all forced, forced together. And I guess. A large piece of it was that when I was 13, uh, our family went on a grand tour, which meant we, we toured Scotland, England, and uh, Holland. And that was with my Scots grandmother. And that was very pivotal in the making of me as a person. Um, it was like six weeks, you know, classic European tour. And um, so I know the book's genesis is that trip, um, and so and so much more. Um, so while we were on that trip, my mother uh, confided in me when I was all, all alone in the hotel room, and my sister and my father were out touring London at night before settling in, and my mother said that she thought she might get a divorce. And I was 13, and it hit really hard. I just dove under the covers and I pulled the blanket out. And from then on, um, I was asked in a podcast just recently, uh, with the, face to face with David Peck, and we talked a lot about that because he, he thought maybe that was the moment I became a writer. And I think I have to agree because um, I, I really started looking, you know, and maybe just in the back of my mind, if I sho shoved that back, I, I still was looking like a writer does in analyzing and listening and recording. Um, so, you know, and first was all, first was my, first my self came through in my paintings and then, you know, I always did poetry and I kept journals. And then the book was, you know, the springboard from everything that built up to it. Um, and, you know, I wanted to address that, what's sidelined in life, you know, and, uh, yeah. And the need to reinvent invent yourself across a long life and to um, take stock of where you are and a lot. Yeah. You have a wonderful ear for language and aphorism in particular. The, the book that I've read, you, um, the phrases leap off the page and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's lovely. Um, it surprised me, and the wisdom. I will say, I want to tell you a little bit about Violet. When I began the novel, it was, it was a far simpler piece. It was just like, you know, the classic little, a novel. It was a simple novel in my mind. And there'd be a party that, you know, what, 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 what if I got to, you know, restore that, buy that house that I had fallen in love with in, in, in Scotland. And, you know, just my imagination went with it. Um, but um, then, so I'm working along on the book, and I've got the protagonist and the, the male and the female, and I really have a hard time liking, let alone even connecting with my female protagonist. 
and I, I, would, I was all in on the, the mail. And um, so I was kind of slugging and thinking, you know, it just, it just wasn't the book, even though I kept struggling with it. And then all of a sudden, uh, it happened, you know, very quickly, and it was really powerful. And I, and I would say it was a mystical experience. But one night, I, I think I woke up, or the first night, that Violet came to me. And she did. And, and um, I went down, and I wrote by a soft light, you know, in the middle of the night. And, and, and she just poured. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, like, some crazy new age out of body experience or something. But, I, but to put it more down to earth, I, I think Bob Dylan said it really well when he said the songs that came through me, the, the best of his songs, he said, I was just there at the right time. It just channeled and it came through me. And, and I think that's true. You're just sitting on a bank. But well, all I know is I met Violet in the middle of the night. And she kept waking me up for a whole summer. And all the, all, she, she opens every chapter. And they all are as they came to me. Literally, I just, and they're there. You know, maybe a tight, a little bit of a tightening, but they're untouched. They were, she, she's just so unstoppable. And, um, yeah. You know, she, she did things in her life that I wasn't brave enough to, to, to do with mine. And, yeah. So, there you are. You're <laughs> vicariously. Yeah, through Violet, yeah. It's an interesting structure because Violet's pieces, passages, are at the head of the chapter and then the story unfolds out of them. Yeah, it really became a tapestry, yeah. an incredibly intricate weaving. And, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. You've got, you've got to want it. Um, I think the principal character sheet that I've added, had the editors add back in will help because it's a little map. Um, I like legends. I've drawn one that, you know, meets my life. And that, that's going to be uh, in the, whatever the first page is, the front piece of my second novel. I have a second novel underway. I'm a quarter of the way through it. And so, yeah. So the art and the writing are integral. Um, is it a sequel? No, it's not related at all. <laughs> no. The second one's a bouncing off my experience. Uh, I left home when I was 19 and ended up in the Yucatan in a Mayan village and had very, very powerful experiences there. Uh, you know, being befriended by the Mayans, um, getting into a lot of trouble, and being rescued by the Mayans. And most importantly, you know, there was this one, the woman, Rosalita. Should I, should I go into the second book? No. <laughs> you do what you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Rosalita, you know, I, I dated a Mayan, and I'm there in the village, the chickens, the gossiping women in their little, you know, tapestry clothes, whole bit. And I, that's my first experience away from Vermont. So, you know, all the snow chop children that have grown up in the gray, and I remember just being blown away by the terrorist community. Wait, you know, like, like, where am I? How can this exist? Um, and Rosa, so I, I'm not going to tell it all, but uh, Rosalie's leader rescued me and befriended me in a bad situation, and those, those kind of follow me. <laughs> situations. And Rosalita, then when it was time for me to leave, it was, a, it was a, it's never going to leave me. Uh, she, they're so poor, and she had four at least, maybe five girls, and her silent husband, who was like a little Hemingway fisherman, you know, in the corner, never said a word. And every time I visit them, I think, why didn't I have more money, you know, for my summer camp experience back here in Vermont? Because <laughs> I, you know, it, it's the 70s, and and all our generations rucksacking it, doing it in Europe. I'm in the UK town, and um, I bring coffee and rolls and chocolate milk. And anyway, and I just love that family so, so very much, and all the little girls, and they taught me to make, you know, we cook and make handmade tamales and stuff in the kitchen. And then it was time to leave, and the most powerful experience, I think for a 19-year-old, that this woman, Rosa Vida, had the girls all cleaned up and dressed up on my last goodbye, 
And she said, I beg you, Joanne, please, please take one of the girls back with you to America. They all want to go. And the little, like, three-year-old came and sat on my lap. And I seriously, seriously wanted to. But I knew my mind's like, really? And I was like, oh, my God, you know, like, I don't have the papers, Rosalie. I said, I can't just put her on the plane with me and bring her home. I did bring home Ming many years later. I always knew I wanted to adopt. So that could, that, if there was a way that I could have gotten one of those little girls, like baby Balin, home, I would have. But it wasn't going to happen. It, those children and Rosalita have never ever left me. Of course, I said that already. But um, so that's that's where that's where book two is. Book two is going to be you know the memoir pieces of my travels, but it's all a novel and it takes place in Mexico City. So what could Violet have possibly done that was braver than that? Oh God, a lot of things like just a lot, a lot. Read the book <laughs> and then subtract. <laughs> Um, yeah, because, yeah, because things went down after that, <laughs> things got worse for me after that, um, but in a beautiful way, I have Holly, I have Holly, my eldest, and, um, yeah, so, because I, I've, I've been juggling a lot of balls all my life, and, um, I did go back to school, so Holly and I went back to school, and I finally made it back, um, uh, went to UVM. Here I am now, with a novel. <laughs> yeah. So you said your travels, Where other? what other places have you visited in your interesting life? Ah, okay. Well, in 2000, um, at the sort of, I think it's like the, sort of like a midpoint of my marriage, this was Violet-esque. Oh, I, I, I had this vision, I would never seen Italy. And I'm half Italian, but you could call that 150%. It's like out of balance. And um, I just said to myself, it's never going to happen. i got to see it now. I was in my 40th year, 41 or something. And I had just gotten back from adopting Ming Fen. She was three. And, and during that, right when she landed, I, I, I just ardently started, you know, on the old dial-up computers, writing to every school, because I have an elementary education degree, and I wrote to every international school in Italy, top to bottom. And I had two replies. One was from Trieste, and there was a war zone up there. And the other one was from a, a private school in Rome. And it took two years for this woman who had fallen in love with my program, and I guess me. And, and she, kept, she kept waiting for her first grade teacher to retire. She wanted me in. And then, uh, finally, it happened. First, she offered me a one-room schoolhouse in, like, a gambling town on the Adriatic. And, and you had to teach kindergarten all the way through, oh, my God, at least eighth grade. It was, it was maybe tenth. And, and the minute I got to the math part, I said, no, that's not happening. <laughs> I can't do any of that. All the rest, okay. So I finally got the job at this incredible alternative school. And... The thought was the whole family would go somehow, but in the end, um, the sal my salary was total would, would only support me, and I had an apartment came with it. And John stayed and, and worked his job, just couldn't do it any other way, and he wasn't going to find something. So at that point, um, Violet appeared, I guess you'd say, because I said, you know, I remember my father pulling me aside and saying, Are you sure you want to do this? I'm like, what do you not get, Dad? <laughs> you know, like, Rome and little first grade sweeties. So, um, you know, I went with the three smaller children, probably left in college. And um, I had a seven month sabbatical. Plus, what you were asking about, like, what other travels? Yeah. yeah. So I, I lived and worked in Rome. Uh, yeah, and got, got a car from a mafia, <laughs> mafia member out in the field. <laughs> Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Learned to navigate the Roman drivers. And it was a lot of fun. When I came home to Vermont after driving in some, you know, the Castelli Romani, which is south of Rome, is where the Pope has his summer house and it's where all the nobles would go to escape the heat. And that's where I was. In a very a working class neighborhood. The school was in the you know, posh one. And uh, 
when I came home after driving with the tempestuous Italians honking their horns and you know, I, I remember driving through Shelburne and thinking, I'm gonna die. They die here, you know. This is so boring. Why is everybody so polite? Why are the Vermonters waving each other on? Where's the, you know, where is the intensity? I was like, why is everybody waving me for a while? I hate it. I'm like, oh my god, I'm not going to do this. I can't do this. But I did do it. I'm still here. You're still here. But, so that was, that was a big one, yeah. I have to say still, I don't know what Violet could be doing that's more great than what you've shared with us. Well, um, she was very she, she she was very independent and had a lot less fear than I have. So I have to say that. Well, isn't it nice that you can write your fearless self into a fictional character? Yeah, I can at least have a, something to look forward to in another lifetime. <laughs> So are these your whole family that's here with us? No, I have two sons, too. <laughs> and and, and Megan and Sam are our main friends, high school best buds. Hey, honey. <laughs> Thank you. So I uh, normally this is when I would ask the audience if you have any questions, but <laughs> I'm suspecting you guys already know what the answers to your questions. Uh, is that me, Mom? <laughs> right? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. She, she, yeah. It is. Ruby. Ruby the Chocolatier. <laughs> Joanne just turned on her uh, screen. Do you have a question for us, Joanne? Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Um, no, I don't have a question. Um, I haven't read the book yet. But however, when um, finding is that it's delightful to listen to you talk Aww. about your life and about how what you've done, uh, how you wrote the book, and different things that have, that have affected it, it that you've drawn in. It's just been interesting, and thank you for doing this. Thank you, thank you so much. Joanne's one of the people on the holds list I told you I had for oh. your book. <laughs> I think she's next up. <laughs> Nice. Thank, you. Thank you for your interest, and if you would be so kind, if you're a good read subscriber, uh, write me your write me a review and tell me what you thought. Goodreads.com, Joanne. Uh, Goodreads.com. It's a vast. Uh, people talk about books, share books, and. But even. I'll think about it, but I, I, yeah. I don't usually. Do no, no. I mean, Computer things of course, course, that's fine. Maybe you'll just tell a friend over tea sometime. <laughs> that's of course, no problems. I'm yeah. just, I just value your interest, and I thank you. Will you be doing an audio book? There is an audible. The, uh, I could read you uh, Molly's quote. Sure. Do you want to? Yeah, because she's story? quite famous. I did. I, I hired a narrator. She's finished. It's being a, it's in the approval process by Audible, and it could be out within a month or oh, a few weeks, fantastic. I think. Cause she's, she's okay, uh, and I have I have arcs or advanced copies out to many people, and the holidays I guess are not a good time to <laughs> ask of all the people who said they'd write me a review, and, and really some noteworthy people that it, it could have happened before, <laughs> and it could have gone on the book. But you're here. I'm here, here now. We, we, we're just going to watch it stay in the But so I, I found Molly by a very, also a very magical, I have to say, mystical experience. I went on Audible, and you'll see hundreds of narrators. And I said, oh my god, you know, this, this book is, you know, I'm a Vermonter, it's got a political bend, it's, it's not going to be missed. And maybe I should just narrow the pool to California and Oregon. I said, <laughs> and I did that. And I had many, many requests, and, and I only was open to a female narrator. And it was really neat. I actually printed all the replies because the narrator will read the audition clip, which is what I read to you at the beginning, Violet's opening. And so many, uh, I saved them for you know my scrapbook. And so many women wrote and said, "Oh my 
my God, who is this woman? I, I want this book. I want this book. I, you know, she's, she's killing me. And that, that was really nice because I think the hardest part about, well, I'm sure it's the same for every author, but your first time and without a publisher as an indie author is a very alone place. You know, so you've done all this work and then you're waiting for any morsel, any, you know, any word that I've connected with someone after all of that. Because that's the whole purpose. I'm certainly not making money. I'm in the hole. You know, because I, I did the whole nine yards on everything um, that I could to support the book and work with Crooked's Editorial, which is a great place for young, anybody who wants to write, please don't look further than Kirkus Editorial. The Kirkus Review people have a whole separate business, which is the editorial side. Yeah, they're phenomenal. Um, four different editors, and you can keep going back, you know, uh, if you take a long, I, I paid for a second round on parts of it. But anyway, when it came to the Audible, um, this woman, Molly, from Tennessee, Molly Secours said, um, uh, you know, I've got goosebumps on the back of my arms. And whatever happens, just please consider me. And if you choose somebody else, please, and it falls through, I hate to say this, you know, wish anybody bad luck in the process, but come find me. Mm -hmm. So as it turned out, I, I did uh, work with Molly. And this is what she just wrote me a review in. Molly um, wrote a book called The White Privilege Pop Quiz. Mm, if I have an extra copy, I'll donate it to your library. And she's a filmmaker, an activist, a narrator, and a speaker. And she's frequently interviewed by NPR. And she's lived alone for 20 years. So for Violet, who's a single woman on an island, and very independent, how could this have ever happened? As Molly said, the universe Poster. The universe spoke. The universe brought me a living violet, the real embodiment. She survived uh, cancer. She's she's my age. She's 65. Anyway, she's just phenomenal, and the whole thing was a big, big gift. So here's what she wrote: Reading never a cloud is akin to navigating a dream in which all the main characters are familiars who become less and less solid the more we learn about them. And isn't that just like life? <clears throat> As a painter, Joe Bernini understands complexity and color and the elusive and material nature of reality and how essential light is for revelation. Every family is burdened by the weight of the lies told by those who deem the truth too difficult a burden to bear. And Violet, our trusty narrator, usher, ushers us in and out of time as she gently and deliberately drops breadcrumbs and all of us home to ourselves. Mm. So I don't know if I'll ever get a review that hits me more than that, but um, I'm, I'm so grateful. It's very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was nice to have you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.